nobody really knows exactly where the word Africa comes from. You ask people and they'll give you their own version. Was it the name of a leader who came from Yemen who invaded North Africa? Or was it the name of a place near Tunisia that the Romans call Ishiritia? Or was it from the Greek who called the place Africa because in their language, Frick means the place of horror and a place that is so cold. But they put the prefix A to make it Africa, a place of sunshine and beauty. Or is it a name that means the place for beauty and fruits? No one knows. But what we know is that we, in this hall, we are all Africans. We were all born in Africa. It is the mother of all continents. It is also the birthplace for humankind. The first woman was born somewhere between Ethiopia, Kenya, somewhere there, Afarensis. And in her name, you have the word Afar, which could also be a meaning or the beginning of the word Africa. It is a group, an ethnic tribe in today's Djibouti, where you have the Afar and the Isas. So the Afar and the Isas went into a very brutal war. So Africa, in a sense, what we know today is that it is an extraordinary large continent, but it is not always shown like that on maps. We'll come to that later. Today, it has 54 countries. These countries are all member states of the United Nations, even though there are still one or two cases of decolonization going on. But when the United Nations was created in 1945, after the Second World War, by the way, some people thought that the United Nations should actually be established here, with a headquarter here in Newport. But we'll come back to that later. Some thought it should be on the West Coast, but it ended up in New York, where I work. When the United Nations was founded more than 70 years ago, there were only about 51 member states. And among them, very few African countries that included Egypt, South Africa, Liberia, and one or two other countries like Ethiopia. These were the founding members of the United Nations. Why were these countries part of the United Nations and not the others? Because these countries were not colonized. These countries did not belong to Western countries. Monrovia is the capital of Liberia. The capital of Liberia was named after the president Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, three American presidents who sent slave ships back to Africa with slaves who had been freed. They created, in inverted comma, Liberia, and they named it Monrovia after President Monroe. Egypt was not a colony, and Ethiopia fought against the, at the Italians in Adowa. So you had these countries, including South Africa, but South Africa was kicked out more than 21 years ago when they did not accept to abolish apartheid. They only came back after Nelson Mandela was freed. So in the 60s and the 70s, from only four to five African member states in the United Nations, you suddenly had like 50 member states coming back and being accepted as fully-fledged member state of the United Nations because they have gained their own independence. And you had a country that recently joined the United Nations, that is South Sudan. Sudan was divided, and there was a very brutal war for more than 25 years between the Southerners and the other Sudanese. And that war led to the creation of South Sudan, where a conflict is now brewing. Yesterday, at the United Nations, our new Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, made an important speech. That was on the occasion of the commemoration 
of the slave trade, in honoring the victim of, the, of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. What you must know is that this continent, Africa, was the victim, and I quote the Secretary General, of the largest, the largest forced migration of people where millions of Africa were not only deprived of their dignity, but often, in some cases, deprived of their own lives. So the Atlantic Ocean, if you only stop at the transatlantic slave trade, is the largest cemetery in the world. There are millions and millions of people who never made it from the African coast, whether it's the West Coast, the East Coast, the Southern Coast, trying to come to this part of the world. So Africa was hit extremely hard, very hard, by the slave trade because slave trade masters were looking for the young, for the able bodies, for the strong, and sometimes even using men, African men, as studs to create more slaves who will then be used for labor without being paid. And they were looking for young women and so on. So when you hit an entire continent throughout a slave trade that lasted centuries, not 10 years, not 50 years, the impact of that is still reflected in today's Africa. That is why a country like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and soon we will see another map that will show you how large Africa truly is. Because of the European very centric approach to the world, they always want to show Europe as being the center of the world. But if you have another projection of the world, you will see how truly large Africa is. This is why a country like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, when there was this scramble for Africa, once belonged to an individual. King Leopold of Belgium had the Democratic Republic of the Congo as a property. It was his own thing, just like you own your apartment or your house. And yet, Belgium today, that kingdom, is only 9 to 10 million people. The Congo today is between 70 and 80 million people. And the Congo is larger than Western Europe. And yet, it belonged to a king. It was the scramble for Africa. France owned certain countries. The United Kingdom owned certain countries. Spain owned certain countries. And this colonial history today makes that we still have many peacekeeping operations that are the result not only of the, the wrong and very poor governance that you see by Africans themselves, but also a consequence of history. The conflict of Western Sahara, a country that is a member of the African Union and not yet, or not a member of the United Nations, is simply because the colonial uh, situation with Spain as a colonial power and now Morocco and Western Sahara being at loggerhead with this country. I once served as a spokesperson of the United Nations in Ethiopia and Eritrea. And I had to serve in both locations, Addis Ababa and Asmara, just because the two countries were divided. Also a result of bitter conflict between leaders, but also the result of colonial situation. So what you must know today, if you don't know it, because in Western media, and including in this country, sometimes a whole month will go by without anyone ever mentioning the African continent or the word Africa. It happens, and it is sad. So, tell me something. Do you have a telephone? Do you have a cell phone? Show me. I have one. Show me your cell phone. Please, bring it out. I have a cell phone. Please, show, show, show it to me. You see, it's a very small thing. Be before, cell phones used to be very big. I also have something else in my pocket, which you may not have. I have a pen. We are not going to name the company, but it has a bit of ivory here. That's a precious pen. I have another pen, which is a, a gift from my daughter. It has a precious stone. Now, these three items, this pen, that pen, and more importantly, this telephone that you all have, these are the sources of conflict. This is the reason why the United Nations Security Council which is the principal organ of the United Nations tasked with international peace and security, send peacekeepers to Africa. This telephone is small, and you like it because you can now charge it. You can use it for two or three days. 
because you can put so much in it because the manufacturers have now managed to build it in such a way that it can send video, it can do so much because of one product that is in this form. It is called Colten. It is a, a, a work from Columbine and Tantalium. And you find that in only one country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the price of Colten can reach sometimes $600 for per kilo. You need this now for your laptops, for your videos, to watch Netflix, to make calls on WhatsApp and everything. Because with the Colten in the new telephones, you can keep energy longer, you can put chips as many as you want, you can do all kinds of things. In a sense, we are all responsible for that crisis in the Congo. Little kids and sometimes young women have to go down the mines because this product, the curtain, has to be digged the old-fashioned way. They go down the mines and it takes a few people who have weapons, who control the territory, to export it and send it here. I was once the head of office in the Democratic Republic of a region called the Kasai. Now, this region is larger than Belgium, almost as large as France. But I only had 300 staff, a few helicopters, to manage that kind of territory. And yet, this is very limited. The Kasai is a region that is that big, and we can now see, if we show you the next map, how big Africa is. And in the Kasai, a place that is as big as California or France, I only had 300 people, a few helicopters. It is a place that is large, but that has no roads, no infrastructure. And yet, that is the challenge of the United Nations. The United Nations is sometimes sent out there to meet challenges that are very difficult to meet. And we do our best. We have successes and sometimes we have failures. I once worked in Mozambique in 1994, 93, during the peace process, and it was a conflict between Renamo and Frelimo. They were invited by the Vatican, by the Saint Exudo religious community, and they agreed to sign peace. You can only keep peace where there is a peace to keep. And it is because of this agreement that a peacekeeping operation was invited. Then we helped them with elections, demobilization of former combatants, and reconstruction. Peace is a complex package. You have to rebuild schools, but first and foremost, you have to find truth, reconciliation, so that you only have, you don't only have peace, you also have peace of mind. So this is Africa. You see in this continent, if you give it the right projection, you can put it in the United States, you can put it China, India, you can put it Western Europe on the top, on the top tier, you can have the whole of Western Europe. And even in Madagascar, Madagascar, you can fit it the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And yet, Africa is not known. And yet, because we are a family of nations, because the General Assembly of the United Nations now has 193 member states, it is our responsibility to ensure that we support the weakest among the family of men. Otherwise, if we don't support the weakest among ourselves, the Mediterranean Sea, which separates Africa, North Africa, from Europe, or the Atlantic Ocean, where so many people died, will not be strong enough, will not be a wall, a barrier, challenging enough. People will swim, people will walk, and people will come here, and this will haunt us, because at the end, what we know is that, after all, Africa shows us that we are only part of the same global family. Our first mother, Afarensis, was born there. And our color only changed because of climate change, migration, because we moved. And those who travel far in cold places became a bit whiter because of sunshine, because of all kinds of complex genetic changes. We are the same. We are in the same family. And Africa is not a country or it's not a continent that only knows conflict. There is so much. There are only a few peacekeeping operations now in Somalia, in Mali, in the Congo, in Darfur, and other places. But the rest of African countries, more than 70% of African countries are in peace. And among the 10, the 10 countries today where you have growth, eight of them are from Africa. 1.3 billion people. The future, believe me, is Africans. And I just want to say that if we come back to the earlier definition, 
let us think of what the sea, of what the airplanes, when we travel, we move. And let us think about Newport. Think about New York. Think about the White House. But all that was somehow built because of the connection with the first among all continents. People who made the great wealth, well, it was because they invested in what was, at the time, very rewarding. I once met two years ago because I was in charge of this commemoration on slave trade. I went to Mobile, Alabama, and I met the family of Cujo Lois, the last slave on the last ship in the United States. This man died in the early 30s, and you can still see his grandchildren and great-grandchildren there in this country. Just to say that when you see that the slaves built the White House or contributed so much to the wealth, not only of this country, but also what you call the triangular trade, sugar, linen, cotton, all those things that were gold those days and that made this country, we must make sure that our telephones, the way of life we want to keep, our pens, our WhatsApp, Yahoo, and all those things, that we do not leave and take advantage of that on the back of the suffering of so many, of the rape of women, of the enslavement of children, of child soldiers. I thank you. Think of Africa being the mother of all continents and maybe the hope of our global village. Thank you so much. <laughs>